Prime Minister thanks churches for commitment and passion. Hundreds flock to Boram Airport to welcome Grand Chief. And over 1,000 West Papuans, now PNG citizens. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tolo. Good evening on this Holy Thursday. Thank you for joining us for National MTV News. The outstanding contributions of the church and the Christian community have greatly impacted the country in more ways than one. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, in his Easter message, thanked the church and the Christian community for their commitment and compassion. He said Christian denominations go beyond delivering to the needs in rural areas. Resurrection. In his Easter message, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill said the government will continue to advance direct funding of churches. He said church-established services have strengthened the education and health sector. In extending my greetings to all Christian communities and families, I want to acknowledge with gratitude the wonderful contribution of the Christian churches and the Christian community so that they continue to make all our aspects of our national life livable. Without the services the church organizes and provide right across the country, the living standards in many of these communities and families will continue to suffer. I thank the church school teachers, church health workers, and many more for their dedicated services that you continue to provide to our communities right across the nation. On behalf of our government, I thank the leaders of all our Christian churches for their great commitment and great compassion. Mr. O'Neill also congratulated Catholic Archbishop Sir John Ribot on becoming the country's first cardinal. He said this signifies the acknowledgement of the importance of Christianity in Papua New Guinea. Meanwhile, Cardinal Sir John Ribot's Easter message is calling for unity during this election period. On the eve of the upcoming elections, he said often the candidates cause division that lasts even after the elections. Even where I can say that we have a responsibility to the nation and it is a constitutional requirement for all members, all members, candidates, and also all citizens, all of us. And we should not allow this event for election, preparing for the election and listening to all kind of uh, campaign and so on to divide and destroy us. But our focus is to be united and build a one Papua New Guinea nation. And this is, should be our concern. Christians will commence their Easter programs tonight with Holy Thursday Mass, emulating the Last Supper of Jesus and his disciples more than 2,000 years ago. In marking Good Friday tomorrow, the Stations of the Cross will commence at the Don Bosco Technical College at Tarama at 4 a.m. and end at Mary Queen of the Pacific Parish in Waigani. Merlin Diakotam, National MTV News. Police in Leh will conduct a special Easter operation throughout the city starting tomorrow. Random roadblocks and foot patrols will be carried out in various locations. Leh Metropolitan Commander, Chief Superintendent Anthony Wagambi warned residents not to cause disturbances in the community during the Easter period. Those intending to cause problems will be dealt with. There is also a directive from the Leh District Court that bail for all offences is set at 300 kina. There will be a special court sitting on Monday, depending on the number of detainees in the cell. But on behalf of the police personnel and their families, the Lay Metropolitan Command wishes Lay residents a safe and happy Easter celebration. National Airports Corporation farewelled Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare with a washdown of the aircraft he was travelling in this morning as he departed Port Moresby for WIWAC. NAC Acting Managing Director Richard Yopo said the washdown is a show of appreciation and respect for the great leader. Following his resignation in politics, Sir Michael and Lady Veronica were at any Guinness corporate lounge this morning to board a chartered flight to WIWEC. Gifts by individuals and organizations continue to couple as people shared moments with the Grand Chief. Yes. Yes. The Grand Chief, Sir M.T. Somari. Uh, farewell from uh, our country, Kokoneta. Thank you. 
The entire NAC workforce, including the top management, were out in numbers to favor Sir Michael. Parliament staff, media and members of the Somare family also boarded the flight. Sir Michael and Lady Veronica were given a red carpet farewell as they boarded the plane. As PX5120 slowly taxied out onto the tarmac, the NAC fire service turned on the horses for a washdown before the aircraft took off. Thing here is that you know we we really really have to uh, honor the past you know to appreciate the present day. Uh, see if if our parents, including uh, Sir Michael and, and Lady Veronica, if they had not put the effort into um, uh, bring us this far, uh, you know the story would have been different. Sir Michael will be officially handed over to the East Sipic Provincial Government by Deputy Speaker John Simon. A week-long celebration is expected as the Grand Chief plans to visit all districts for the final time. Jack Lapave, Junior National, MTV News. Upon his arrival at Wewak's Boram Airport, the chartered flight was given a washdown by the local fire service department. Members of the East Sipic Provincial Government lined up to welcome the Grand Chief and his delegation. Sir Michael was given a guard of honour by members of the Papua New Guinea Defence Force. Hundreds flocked to Boram Airport to witness the arrival of Sir Michael and Lady Veronica. Traffic in Weebeck Town came to a standstill as vehicles convoyed with the ACP governor this afternoon. Over 1,000 West Papuan refugees in Western Province are now Papua New Guinea citizens. Part of a national policy, the refugees were given special consideration by the national government to be granted PNG citizenship. Following a national government decision in 2014, 690 refugees at the East Awin West Papua camp were given PNG citizenship on Tuesday. Got good blood passing, I mean, my soil, long culture, passing long country, language, long country. So, long side, long all this, la, we play, look, so long all. And I think you play meeting more than this, la, requirement, penis. For the refugees, becoming PNG citizens gives them access to basic services, something they have been missing out on for years. The road leading into East Awin remains one of the many challenges these people face. The problem people are facing is a road problem. And before you get to the up now, we look at the situation here. We play in Sapa and Sapa Road. The service is good, school, housing, and right. That's one of the road problem. However, after being declared Papua New Guineans, their hope is now for a better future. Especially you say more school picnic or you mean or can travel some black policy or some out outside some black countries or can go and more some now more some free no mixing free seat and especially in this life. Me and Mama slow this life because some by helping more lo stop lo lo here or can seem um access lo making some something where all government or Papua New Guinea can allow him more. Because now we more come up citizen of Pins. On Monday, a similar ceremony was held in Kyunga town, where over 400 refugees were given citizenships. So, MB, thank you. Me hard express him now. Today, me feel him also, me hard express him. Bisla, Amamas, where me like express him, Golo, Onil Diem Gaman. And also, all our officers on the ground who said implementing this exercise. Stanley Ove Jr., National MTV News. A secondary school teacher is nursing wounds at Kimbe General Hospital after being attacked by a student. 
A source told MTV News the student was supposed to bring his parents to face the school board for disciplinary matters. However, he returned with a bush knife and attacked the teacher. The male teacher had his left hand and wrist chopped off and his left cheek sliced. The student has been apprehended as, and is in police custody. The Division of Education in West New Britain has condemned the action of the student. The main, main teacher is from Southern Highlands and was appointed as Deputy Headmaster at Gloucester High School since 2014. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. The Association of Superannuation Funds of Papua New Guinea has made a submission to government highlighting the unintended consequences of prospective amendments to the proposed taxation bill. The association believes that if the bill falls through by the end of this year, customer returns derived from investment dividends will plummet drastically. The association also underlines other loopholes in the national legislation that may disadvantage many. The general concern raised by PNG superannuation peak bodies here is that the overall tax on superannuation fund investors will have an adverse effect on their customers' returns. Say, for example, um, uh, Company A, we invest in, in, in Company A directly. When they declare dividend and then it's paid to us, then there's a, there's a certain amount of tax that is paid, but it's only taxed once. If we have an investment in Company A, who also has an investment in Company B, and Company B, you know, uh, pays dividend to us, then Company A th that pays uh, dividend to Company B is then taxed, and then Company B that pays the dividend to us is, is, is then taxed again. So it's like a triple tax, in, to put it in simple terms. Huh? The dividend rebate that the government has proposed to remove under the amended Income Tax Act ensures that profits distributed through companies are only taxed once. Tarutia, in his capacity as the interim president of ASF PNG and the CEO of NAS Fund, has asked the government to keep the dividend rebate under the Income Tax Act to protect the interest of their customers. Tarutia also made mention of certain legislative reforms needing review to reflect the circumstances under which superannuation funds operate. These include contradictory features which allow for early access to savings. Allows early access, you know, I'm talking about the unemployment, I'm talking about partial withdrawal, so we become, we act like a de facto bank we, which, when we're not supposed to be so. The association is also concerned that because the legislation does not define clearly what constitutes wages in terms of calculating superannuation, this allows employers to underpay their employees. Some employers who are underpaying you know, their staff, I won't mention sectors, but underpaying their workers who are our Papua New Guineans, and then when the deductions come through, it's not reflective of the hours that they're working. So, so Another feature that Tarutia agreed was unrealistic for a developing democratic country like PNG were the restrictive conditions imposed on superannuations. We should do away with that and look at universal coverage. As long as you're earning some form of income, you're registered with the tax office, then you attract superannuation because it, the superannuation is for the individual's benefit. It's not. For the benefit of the nation, the association insists that a review of the legislation is long overdue. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. With the national general elections nearing, most political parties are now announcing their key areas of focus. No doubt, education is high on most party lists. During this term of parliament, tuition fee-free education has been a mainstay for the government under Prime Minister Peter O'Neill. Although the government says it has enabled more children to go to school, for schools in rural areas, the TFF policy has also created unique challenges. Sometimes, these challenges force teachers to go out of the way in educating the next generation. St. Thomas Primary School in Uyaku, Tufi, Oro Province is one such school. St. Thomas Primary School is located in Uyaku Village, Tufi, Northern Province. Like many schools in rural Papua New Guinea, it aims to educate as many children as it can under the government's tuition fee-free policy. MTV News spoke to Jeffrey Saru, senior teacher at the school. 
Originally from Isipik province, he has been teaching here with his wife since 2014. During this time, he has seen class sizes grow. For his year 8 class, there are now 28 students, an improvement from class numbers of previous years. But there are challenges. He says although the TFF policy accounts for student materials, this is inadequate for schools such as St. Thomas, who have to travel into Popendetta to collect school materials. And given the high cost of travel, very little of TFF funds actually go to student learning materials. The TFF from the government, it helps us very little. The funds we have, most of the funds, uh, it goes to transportation because of the distance. Uh, the high is 3,500 one way and then back another 3,500. So, and then we have higher on PMVs and trucks. Although these materials are crucial for student learning, this problem is further compounded by the fact that most of the previous school materials were lost to Cyclone Guba in 2007 and were not replaced over the last decade. The students' materials and textbooks have been destroyed by flood and haven't been replaced until now. Uh, it was when the cyclone Guba struck this place, everything was spoiled and have not been replaced till now. So very little we have. We pay for students' uh, exercise books and biros and rulers, all these ones. And we have nothing left for infrastructure development. But despite these challenges, the committed staff of St. Thomas continue to persevere in the hope that something can be done by authorities to assist schools such as these in rural areas. The biggest challenge as a teacher teaching here is we try our very best to find resources and teaching materials to cater for our students' learning. Whilst these challenges have been brought to the attention of education officials at the district, provincial and national level, the seeming lack of action in assisting rural schools such as St. Thomas has become common, that it is slowly being accepted as the norm. Despite this, Mr. Saru and his colleagues continue the task of educating the next generation of Papua New Guinea's leaders, albeit under trying circumstances. The Coffee Industry Corporation says they are in control of the Coffee Berry Bora, or CBB, an insect pest destroying coffee production in the country. Principal entomologist Dr. Nelson Simbikin says CBB is only found in eastern highlands and Jiwaka provinces and in isolated areas. Simbikin adds much of the coffee growing provinces are free from the pest. During a one day consultation meeting yesterday, CIC told stakeholders, coffee growers and exporters in Morobe that the coffee berry bora or CBB is only found in two isolated spots. Coffee growers were advised to watch out for the insect pest and report it to CIC if they suspect its presence. CIC has already established a containment exercise. So there are three specific mitigation containment exercises that currently CIC has um, put in place. Um, eradication in um, isolated sites and uh, rehabilitation of coffee gardens with chemical sprays in, in, uh, uh, in the areas that is uh, contagious, the disease area that, is, that have been spreading. The coffee berry borer moves in unprocessed beans cherries, parchment coffee, and in green bean coffee. The CIC says the moisture level at which the beans must be packed should be less than 12%. Unprocessed beans will not be allowed to move out of the infected areas. So the only way uh, that parchment coffee is moved to the major processing uh, facilities in Goroka is to fumigate their coffee. And fumigation is one way where they can move the parchment out from the disease areas. But they must have the apartment uh, having 12% uh, or below moisture level. And then they have to fumigate their 
parchment. Even though the moisture level is below, they have to fumigate their coffee before they bring it down to the major processing facilities in Goroka. The risk level of CBB, however, remains high for all coffee growing provinces. To stop CBB from spreading to other CBB free provinces, CIC has set up roadblocks to deal or control the movement of unprocessed coffee. Green bean is free to pass through roadblocks as long as it is dried properly and has 12% or less moisture. Coffee berry borer moves in unprocessed coffee, cherry and parchment coffee. Um, and also in green bean coffee, if the moisture level is above 12 percent. So the moisture level is very critical for green bean coffee. If the green bean coffee is less than 12 percent, it can be moved across. Um, that is the um, only means of exportable um, coffee in the country. So it must have moisture level below 12 percent for green, coffee, green bean coffee to move. But the unprocessed coffee, which is the cherry and un the parchment, they are not, not to be moved across from the disease area. The attack on coffee will reduce more than 40 percent of export volume. This equates to 200 to 300 million kina losses in a year. It will also increase the cost of production by 40 percent, where large plantations will remain viable but uneconomical. But the thing that will suffer the most is the standard of PNG coffee already recognized all over the world. Mata Luis, National MTV News, Lay. And now a look at the finance news. The Kino closed unchanged at 0.3145 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kino was buying 0.307 US dollars, 0.4051 Australian dollars, 0.2858 Euro and 33.23 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold closed higher, while coffee, cocoa and copper closed the day lower. Palm oil closed higher, while crude oil and copper closed the day lower. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed 59 points lower, the ASX closed 44 points lower, and the All Ordinaries closed 43 points lower. Story is making headlines overseas when we come back. Talks will continue between the United States and Russia on the war in Syria. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. Turning overseas now, following the chemical attack in Syria, U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson held talks with his Russian counterpart to pressure Russia to withdraw their support for Syria. However, no favorable outcome was delivered from the talks, prompting U.S. President Donald Trump to say that the U.S. and Russia relations are at an all-time low. Four hours of crucial, contentious talks with Russian officials, including an unscheduled meeting with President Vladimir Putin himself. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov finally faced the press. The current state of U.S.-Russia relations is at a low point. There is a low level of trust between our two countries. The world's two foremost nuclear powers cannot have this kind of relationship. The many hours we spent with Rex Tillerson together and with the president of the Russian Federation were not spent in vain. We understand each other better. The most that was likely to come from this, an agreement to keep on talking, a working group to tackle the most critical issues. President Trump also weighed in today from the White House. Right now, we're not getting along with Russia at all. We may be at an all-time low in terms of uh, relationship with Russia. But dark shades of the deep divisions still seep through all the attempts at common ground. Russia still won't accept Syrian President Assad's responsibility for the chemical attack, repeatedly insisting on a full investigation. The U.S.'s view... The facts that we have uh, are conclusive, that the recent chemical weapons attack carried out in Syria was planned, and it was directed and executed by Syrian regime forces. Tillerson says Assad's days are numbered. Russia explained at length why ousting him now could be disastrous. On the delicate issue of Russia's interference in the U.S. election. As to 
the question of the interference with the election, that is fairly well established in the United States. It's one that we know is uh, serious enough to attract additional sanctions. While Lavrov again called for more information. Not a single fact has been confirmed. Who saw those facts? We don't know. Nobody has shown us anything. The rhetoric from both sides has been stark and relentless and still yet to meet Presidents Putin and Trump, who laid out the problems here most bluntly today. Putin is backing a person that's truly an evil person. And I think it's very bad for Russia. I think it's very bad for mankind. It's very bad for this world. But when you drop gas or bombs, this is an animal. Defending the missile strikes on Syria that Russia considers illegal. That's a butcher. So I felt we had to do something about it. I have absolutely no doubt we did the right thing. What you didn't hear out of this, though, was Russia backing away from supporting Assad anytime soon. And a State Department official I talked to said they, they see the chances of this happening in the near term at next to zero. That Putin is deeply worried that if Assad suddenly goes now, that's a power vacuum, terrorists rush in, uh, that Russia isn't blind to Assad being a terrible choice. But at this point, they see him as the best if not the only choice. So what the U.S. wants Russia to do is convince Syria to look again at a ceasefire, then the political process. Problem is, though, nobody knows how long this could take or really how willing Russia will be to play. The U.S.-led military push to dislodge ISIS from the Syrian stronghold of Raqqa could get underway soon, possibly within months. Since 2014, the terror group has lost a huge amount of territory in its so-called caliphate. Those losses are shown in green on your screen. Here's CNN's exclusive interview with the U.S. commander, now making final preparations to liberate Raqqa. He commands the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria and flies now over a battlefield that seems to go from impossibly complicated to worse day by day. But the next key fight for ISIS's de facto capital, Raqqa, is now very close. I certainly hope that the assault on Raqqa is underway by this summer. Complete by when? Don't know. It's up to them. Months? It's up to them. Would you be surprised if you were still fighting that fight by 2018? In Raqqa City? Yes. Another long, hard fight he may well need more U.S. boots on the ground for. Right now, I think we have the resources we need there to uh, isolate, to do what we're, the task we're doing right now, which is complete the isolation of Raqqa. Um, after the isolation of Raqqa uh, will come the assault, and uh, we're still evaluating what resources we need. Uh, if I need more resources, I'll go to my leadership, uh, my chain of command, and tell them what we need to get the job done. And now he must evaluate another possible complexity or enemy after President Trump launched 59 Tomahawk missiles against the Syrian regime, backed by Russia, for a chemical weapons attack in Idlib. Has your thinking about Russian or Syrian regime involvement and Raqqa had to change since the airstrikes in the past weeks or so? against Syrian regime targets by the U.S.? Yeah, I would say that probably our thinking has changed a little bit, but uh, I'm not sure, I couldn't say specifically how. Are you having to take into account the possibility the Syrian regime might use sarin against U.S. facilities or assets here? Sure, we have to take that into account. I'm not greatly concerned by that. Is it a risk in your mind? Do you worry about it's it when you wake up small, in the morning? Of course, it's a possibility, so it's a risk. I think it's a very small risk. Okay. Let me just say on that last question, yeah, I don't sure. think the Syrian regime wants to pick a fight with the United States or the global coalition against ISIS. And uh, to, to uh, you know, if you take what you just said a step further, that's what they're doing. They're choosing to directly uh, fight the United States and the global coalition against ISIS. I don't think they want to do that. U.S.-backed rebel Syrian forces are isolating Raqqa from the north, east and west and may very soon move to isolate from the south, nearer where Russian and regime forces are. Yet, he said he is, as of now, not coordinating the Raqqa push with Russia or Syria at all. Do the regime or Russian forces 
have any role in your planning for the liberation of Raqqa? Um, right now, we are not uh, planning. We're not. Plan we're not. We don't. We're not planning or coordinating with them. They're not even. They're not even located near Raqqa. But they don't so, figure as part of your operations to liberate that city. We we think they have their hands full doing their tasks in Syria, and uh, they're probably happy to let the Syrian Democratic Forces and uh, and the coalition uh, tackle Raqqa. Two World War II veterans have been presented with France's highest military accolade at a ceremony in Brisbane. Now in the 90s, the former Air Force officers were awarded the Legion of Honor Medal for their course during France's D-Day battle. 73 years, but time didn't lessen the emotion for these two World War II veterans receiving France's highest military honour. In front of family and friends, Australia's ambassador to France bestowed 92-year-old Lindsay Hibbard from northern New South Wales with the insignia of the Legion of Honour. You are now a knight in the order of the Legion of Honour. My congratulations. <laughs> Mr Hibbard was only 18 when he enlisted as a communication controller in the Royal Australian Air Force in 1942. In 1945 his plane came under attack during a night raid over Germany but he managed to guide his crew to a safe landing. Well I don't think they did anything to earn it so <laughs> I feel a bit guilty. Alongside him today receiving the same award was 92 year old Kenneth MacDonald. He was 20 when his bomber plane was shot at and and exploded mid-air. plane snuck up underneath us and uh, set us on fire. Kenneth and Lindsay are two of 200 Australians who received the Legion of Honour medal for their service in France's D-Day battle. You're watching National MTV News. True Guy Sports is next. We'll have all the details when we return. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. To cricket, United Arab Emirates wicketkeeper Ghulam Shaba has been fined 20% of his match fee after illegally stumping PNG batsman Lega Siaka. Siaka was on his way towards improving PNG's 148 runs during the third one day international last week when Shaba hit the stumps with his gloves instead of the ball and appealed for an out. That resulted in Siaka's dismissal. After winning a match each, the Emirates and the Barmandis played the ODI decider last Tuesday when the incident occurred in the 20th minute of PNG's innings. Shaba appealed successfully for a direct hit run out of PNG batsman Lega Siaka. But a post-match review of TV replay showed that the ball had not hit the stumps and Shaba had broken the wickets with his gloves. He has admitted to the offence and accepted the penalties he is facing. The charges were laid by the on-field umpires but because it's a first-time offence, there will be no hearing. In addition, he has been issued a one demerit point. An ICC disciplinary rule where in a space of two years, if a player repeatedly commits an offence, he may be suspended for an indefinite period. Unfortunately, Siaka's dismissal may have as well cost the Barras the win as he is one of PNG's leading batsmen and in most occasions placed in the top order. But in the true spirit of sportsmanship, the Baramandi showed they were not bitter losers. Still three places ahead of the Emirates on the points ladder, they are now hot on the heels of Netherlands who currently holds the top sport. Dino Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. Current Papua New Guinea women's champion Gewa John is one of four women out of the 39 players who have registered for the 2017 Port Mosby Snooker Open. Current Port Mosby Open champion Marcus Ning was nominated along with other big name competitors Nathan Fong and Joey Chan. Toto Geru and PNG Billiards and Snooker Association head Peter Fong will lead the Alotau side, while Gus Krauss is set to make a comeback after missing out on several seasons. The round robin matches are currently underway at Lamana with the best of three frames. The final stages start with the top 16 on Sunday, with the semi finals and finals to be held at the Q Club on Easter Monday. Senior Football Operations Manager of PNG AFL, Rex Lecca, says the PNG Mosquito squad is less than two months away from this year's International Cup title. 
He said selection for the team will be critical as many new talent have been identified in recent years. With less than three months to this year's International Cup title, preparations for the Mosquitoes team are underway as PNG AFL prepares to host trial matches in both the islands and the northern zones this weekend. Senior Operations Manager Rex Lecker says coaches will start keeping an eye out for the performance level of each individual player so that the best team can be finalised before the competition starts in August. We only have a couple of months left for uh, to get ready for the International Cup in August. Um, we've got the most based players that are training um, on Tuesdays, Thursdays at the Cold Soval, Mondays, Wednesdays at the gym at the Tarim Aquatic Centre. Um, we still uh, we have a couple more trial matches um, for the outside centres for the Northern Zone and the Island Zone, uh, which will be um, which I'll be conducting uh, starting this weekend. I fly out to Hagen tomorrow um, to have a um, to have the trials in uh, in Hagen. After the 2014 win in Melbourne, Australia, the team has been keeping up well since then, and now with the season around the corner for Port Moresby-based players, training has become their number one priority. Yeah, the expectations are very high um, after the win back in 2014, 2015, 16 seasons have been really tight around the country. Um, uh, most of the boys have been um, keeping up in gear, um, their fitness level, and um, we're just trying to make the, you know, try to select the best team to get down there and um, um, defend the cup. Like I said, PNG AFL will make sure that 2017 will have no barriers for the boys while looking forward to their biggest rivals, South Africa, New Zealand and Ireland. After missing out in 2014, the PNG women's national team, the Kurakums, will participate in this year's International Cup title and selections for the team will also take place in April and May before both teams will be finalised to travel. Our biggest rivals are always um, New Zealand and um, Ireland. Um, we had a bit of scare in uh, 2014 when, um, when we had the South Africans um, coming back up strong. Uh, well, we lost to South Africa on one of the round robin matches, but uh, uh, we, we managed to get through on the percentage that got us through to the final. Um, so, yeah, South Africa was, is coming strong. Another threat would be um, um, England and um, um, USA as well. With the event to start on August 5th, selections are expected to take place in the next few weeks. Like I said, the PNG Mosquitoes will go even stronger this year with great confidence level and play hard to defend their 2014 International Cup title. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Trukai Sports continues after the break. Don't go away. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To football, it's been months since FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup was played on our shores, generating worldwide interest. However, not much has been done to carry on the legacy of women's football. There was much hype to advance women's issues and football in PNG following the successful hosting of the tournament. Jeremy Mwaki reports. The hype had been built a year earlier. A dedicated team of individuals in the local organizing committee had laid the foundation for arguably PNG's biggest ever sporting event in terms of global reach. A whole host of stakeholders had taken up the challenge and the talk of a lasting legacy after the tournament, one that would see PNG strive to make societal changes. The World Cup had brought hope. Football aside, there was talk of addressing the various issues surrounding gender equality in Papua New Guinea and women's rights and civil liberties. While the government had launched a national strategy to address gender-based violence and women's empowerment in PNG, it was events such as the World Cup that shed light on the issue. And FIFA's arrival into Port Moresby had set the tone for that advocacy. Papua New Guinea had reached no stellar heights throughout the tournament, but the attention that the PNG and the 20th national team had received had easily been the highest of any women's national team ever. <laughs> A relative group of 23 unknowns would turn into household names by tournament's end. Upon retaining his seat as president for the PNG Football Association, David Chung had announced sweeping changes in terms of football for women in PNG. Understandably, 
with political infighting, delays to the fruition of those programs have come about. Proposals for a women's league are still in the pipeline, with further development programs also mooted. However, that has been slow forthcoming. There is no doubt women's football will still be a focus in the future. However, with the World Cup hype over, development plans remain to be formally seen for women's football in Papua New Guinea. Jeremy Moggy, National TV Sports. To the NRL, Brisbane Broncos coach Wayne Bennett still does not know how to use PNG International, David Mead, in his team. Though putting on an outstanding performance in the win over the Roosters last week, Mead has been named on the bench and sees Corey Oates back in the starting lineup on the wing. Bennett says he was impressed with Mead last week and reiterated his shock as to why this week's opponents, the Gold Coast Titans, let Mead go. Moving on, the NRL Telstra Premiership Round 7 matches will kick off with the Bulldogs taking on the Rabbitohs. The match will be played at the ANZ Stadium tomorrow afternoon. Healthy crowd. Both teams have come off with great wins from last weekend. The Bulldogs defeated the Knights and the Rabbitohs slipped past the Panthers with a one-point win. Tomorrow's match will be a tough one. The Bulldogs have more advantage in the front row, while the Rabbitohs, Dylan Walker and Adam Reynolds will be destructive in the halves. In terms of recent form, the Dogs snapped a worrying run of poor form with a gritty 10-7 win over the Broncos, but were less convincing in their win over the Knights. The Rabbitohs bounced back from two losses from the Roosters and the Cowboys and stole a win over the Panthers. He puts his arm up and so one point the margin. The Rabbitohs with 25. Both teams are still struggling to find their form and sit just outside the top eight. Franco Lee, Marcelo Montoya. Elijah Levet, National NTV Sports. And then in Shrugai Sports, don't go away. We have the all-important weather report for Easter when we come back. Shrugai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Here's a quick look at the weather for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Showers then fine for Daru. Light showers in Port Mosby, cloudy bit with some showers for Kerma, Alotau and Popandeta. To the Mombasa region, cloudy with some showers in Leh and Wau, as well as in Wewak and Vanimo. Showers and thunderstorms for Medang. To the New Guinea Islands region, evening showers in Lorengau, fine although cloudy for KV and Kokopo and Rabaul as well as in Buka, cloudy with some showers in Kimbe, West New Britain. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all these major centres can expect some showers over the next 24 hours. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. And to end the news, a recap of our main stories tonight. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill thanks churches for commitment and passion. Hundreds flock to Boram Airport in Wewak to welcome Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. And over 1,000 West Papuans, now Papua New Guinean citizens. And that's been the new sports and weather for tonight. Stick around for the second episode of MTV's Farming PNG, featuring the origin of agriculture in the country. That's coming up in the next few minutes. Meanwhile, on behalf of the entire MTV News team, I'm Mary Botulo. Have a safe, long Easter weekend. Pleasant viewing. Good night.